all across America and around the world. This is Veterans Radio. This is Veterans Radio. Welcome to Veterans Radio. I am Jim Fossone. I'm the officer of the deck today. We've got some great programs for you. I think you'll find very interesting. We always want to remind you, you can find more about Veterans Radio at its Facebook site or by going to veteransradio.net where we're on the web 24-7. You can find a lot of our podcasts there as well. We post new ones every Tuesday, so you can get a new story, a new interview, something you didn't know before by going to veteransradio.net. And before we get started, we want to thank our sponsors. First up, we want to thank National Veteran Business Development Council, nvbdc.org. It was established to certify both service-disabled and veteran-owned businesses. You'll find out how they can help your business by going to nvbdc.org. We want to thank Legal Help for Veterans. Legal Help for Veterans fights for veterans' disability rights all across the nation. You can reach them at 800-693-4800 or on the web at legalhelpforveterans.com. We also want to thank our latest national sponsor, Veteran Lending Council. It is a community dedicated to educating lenders, realtors, and veterans on the VA Home Loan Benefit Program. You can check them out on Facebook and other social media outlets. We want to welcome to Veterans Radio today a distinguished author who wrote an interesting book on a novel on a little slice of World War I history that most people won't know about, Jennifer Chavarini. Welcome to Veterans Radio. Thank you. I'm very honored to be here. Well, this is, a, as I say, a little slice of uh, history that uh, most people won't know about, but the reality is these women that you wrote on are in every state, came from every state in the United States to answer the call of the Army in 1917 when General John Pershing got over to France as part of the American forces in Europe. And one of the things he realized is, Oh, my goodness, the communication here is horrible. Mm -hmm. We don't think about communication in World War I the way we think about communication today. There wasn't secured radio. There were no satellite phones, no cell phones. Tell us about the communication challenges of World War I that really is the sort of basis for this uh, uh, story. Certainly. Well, of course, radio had been invented by that time, but it wasn't technologically advanced enough to serve effectively as it did in later wars. The golden age of radio wouldn't come along until 1920. So at this point in World War I, when General Pershing reached France to start establishing you know, the infrastructure for all of the soldiers who were being recruited very rapidly back in the States – he, you know, he was used to a certain kind of telephone service back in the States. The United States had the most advanced telephone technology at the time. And, of course, the best operators, the, the best trained operators, the most skilled operators. When he got to France, he found that this was not at all the state of communications that he needed to be able to conduct the war. And, of course, France had already been suffering several years of war already, so much of the infrastructure had you know, suffered bombardments and destruction, and certainly there wasn't a lot of – they had their own supply chain issues to be able to make repairs effectively. And a lot of the equipment was outdated, and the operators didn't – they had a different approach to working that switchboard. The American way was to give the number and quickly connect that call and have it done as efficiently as possible, and that wasn't quite what the French telephone operators were 
um, used to. So one of the first things the general did was order American technology to be shipped over and installed. And so a lot of, there were already, before the U.S. entered the war, the different telephone companies had their own reserve corps. They saw what was coming and they wanted to be prepared. So there were already preparing technicians such as linemen and the people to build, men to build the switchboards. So they were ready to come over and start laying the wires and all of that, which is very dangerous because they were very often coming under bombardment or sniper fire as they were trying to uncoil these wires, you know, in very dangerous territory. So then to, to once the every things were being constructed, they needed to have people to operate the switchboards. And if you've seen the the movies or maybe the old TV shows, you might be familiar with this large board and women seated in front of it with these uh, on high stools with a headset and the microphone and you know a light would go off and the operator would insert a cord into one jack and then, you know, speak with the caller and then take the other end of the cable and run it into the corresponding jack for the recipient. And this had to be done very swiftly and quickly. Well, at this point, women were not allowed to enlist in the U.S. Army, but they needed people to run the switchboards. In the U.S., this was almost exclusively a job that women filled. It was considered women's work, and there were a few men who worked as switchboard operators, but it was very, very rare. So they tried to train soldiers to, male soldiers, which is redundant in 1917, to work these switchboards. And they started with telegraph operators because it seemed like they would be analogous skills. And after the soldiers were trained to work the switchboards, they could connect a call in a minute. And that sounds pretty good until you realize that back in the States, a trained, experienced telephone operator could make the same connection in 10 seconds. And, 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 and they're using, again, let's go back to the how we have to rethink the technology. They're running these wires to switchboards and to phones out in the field so that yes. the artillery commander can get whatever direction the general's going to give over a telephone line or to exactly. uh, a corresponding person on the flank to say, hey, it's time to you know uh, proceed on the left flank, hold back on the right. This is These right. commands are all being given by copper wire telephone. Right. And you have to have an operator who can make it quick so that there isn't a minute lag between when right. the, the the order to shell and the shelling occurs. So what exactly. does General Pershing do about this problem uh, that he's got in communications? Well, you've really hit at the heart of it. I mean, he couldn't just, you know, deal with... And, you know, when you're talking about the kind of information that was conveyed, you know, every command, every message sent from headquarters, and then also every every communication that was sent from the American headquarters to their counterparts in the French and British Army, almost every communication was taken place by telephone, these quick ones. Now, they did also use runners, you know, they would have messengers travel, and they sometimes use homing pigeons. But m almost everything was done by telephone. And yes, the wires could be cut, the wires could be accidentally destroyed by shelling, and of course the enemy could tap, tap into them as well. But it was, this was how you had to get the messages across. And 50 seconds makes the difference between victory and victory and loss, uh, success and failure, and for some people, life and death for some of those soldiers. So General Pershing went to the Army and told them that he needed the best telephone operators that they could find, and he needed them as quickly as possible in France. And that meant American women, because they were the ones who were running those switchboards back home. And so even though the Army did not recruit women, they, the Navy was ahead of the Army in this. They had already begun, begun enlisting women um, as yeomen to take over office positions and clerical work and such things to free up men to go to sea. But the Army was not yet enlisting women. But now when General Pershing said, I need them, they obeyed. And they began recruiting women 
um, focusing first on French speaking areas, both in the U.S. and Canada, but then very soon going more broadly. Because there were there are three very important criteria that applicants had to meet just to even be considered. And the first was, of course, that they had to be highly skilled telephone operators. They had to be quick, efficient, and very, very accurate. But then a second criterion, which weeded out a lot of people right away. Other very other women very eager to serve could not because of this one one point. They had to be fluent in French as well as English. And that was because sometimes if they would be connecting a call, say, between an American commander and his counterpart in the in a French uh, headquarters elsewhere, if the two officers, the two men could not speak each other's language, the telephone operator not only had to connect the call, but also had to translate on the spot. And again, when you think about the kind of information they were communicating, every word, every numeral had to be absolutely perfect, had to be spot on. So uh, there were a number of recent immigrants from French-speaking nations, such as French and France and Belgium, and also first-generation Americans, uh, d- the children of French and Belgian immigrants who spoke French in the, on the phone. So, And then, of course, the third criterion was they had to be absolutely loyal and absolutely discreet and clever enough not to accidentally divulge any secrets because they were dealing with very highly sensitive information and they had to be loyal enough to the U.S. and to the allies to not deliberately get anything away. And they also had to be clever enough not to be tricked into divulging anything that otherwise would would cause harm to the Americans and the allies. Because so, they, they often knew what was going on before anybody else did because they listened, they heard snippets of these conversations or translated conversations. So they knew when the headquarters was moving closer to the front or when yes. when a particular um, a campaign was going to start or pull back. Uh, and, and you do a great job in the book, Switchboard Soldiers, and we're talking to Jennifer Chavarini, who wrote Switchboard Soldiers, taking the history of World War One and spinning it into a novel that people will read uh, about the heroic women who served in the U.S. Army Signal Corps during this period. And this, this idea that, hey, we know a little bit more than others do because we're hearing this, and and, and the efforts you have to take to that you don't just accidentally spill the beans. It was You did a right. really good job on that, and I'm not surprised because Jennifer's written 32 novels, and she's a New York <laughs> Times bestseller. Um, she went to the University of Notre Dame and the University of Chicago. So you know how to write, and it really comes through in the, this. Uh, oh, uh, thank you. Just a really good job. But you also had some great history to work with and some great historical figures to put in there. And one of them is Grace Banker that I want you to talk yes. about a little. Yes, just an absolutely amazing woman. And this was it was so exciting to research this story and learn about these incredibly courageous women. You know, out of the 7,600 who applied, Less than or fewer than 250 were accepted into the program initially, and then 33 were selected to be the first group in March of 1918 to sail for France. And Grace Banker, uh, a New Jersey, a woman from uh, New Jersey, a young woman, she was only 25, and she was a very skilled telephone operator working at AT AT&T headquarters in Manhattan. And she was so good, and she had such a natural leadership that she was actually promoted to the position of instructor. So she had experience mentoring and, you know, supervising others and, you know, dealing with a lot of responsibility. But at 25, to have so much responsibility that you are leading this group of uh, telephone operators to to do this very important job, uh, it, it just is so remarkable and so impressive. It made me wish that I had known about this story all along. I really thought that, you know, we should have been learning this in in our high school history classes. We should have known about these women. So I feel like I'm doing my part to help them become better known. 
but but Grace Banker, I mean, all of these women were con- were were courageous and bold and you know so devoted to serving their country they were so so thrilled to have the opportunity to serve their country but you know even among this this group of very remarkable women grace banker stood out and in fact for her service she was awarded the distinguished service medal with a commendation because her work was just so exceptionally meritorious yeah, and, and there I, were other I want to I want to stop on that because um Many of our veteran radio listeners will know what the Dis- a Distinguished Service Cross means. This is the Distinguished Service Medal, um, which is at the same level of, you know, just below the Medal of Honor. You can't get more acknowledgement of your uh, exceptional ability than getting a DSC or a DSM. She received the D- Distinguished Service Medal. And these women suffered all of the things that we know about that the, the men suffered in, in World War One, You know, the U-boat attacks crossing the, the Atlantic, uh, constant shelling, uh, uh, exposure to the Spanish flu. Right. Uh, all, all of those things, these women who were took, a, took an oath uh, as part of the uh, U.S. Single Corps were exposed to and that really puts in context the level of effort and service uh, and commitment that somebody like Grace Banker gave to the country. Yes. And, you know, there is currently a a bill in the Congress that is, it's called the Hello Girls Congressional Gold Medal Act of 2019. So it was introduced in early 2019 and it hasn't gone through yet. Um, I'm, I hope that, it will pass, and that and the telephone operators will receive this additional honor for in, in recognition of what their devotion to duty and their incredible contributions. They made they connected millions of calls during their time over there, and even after the armistice, and the soldiers and sailors began going home. The, many of the women, most of the women, in fact, remained behind because they needed women to work the switchboards at the peace conference in Paris. And they needed women to connect the calls for all of the logistics involved in getting all of the men back home. So they were still there, even and some of them even served in Germany during the with the army of occupation. So they remained long after many, many of the, the sailors or soldiers and sailors had already gone back home and were, you know, resuming their civilian lives. So, um, you know, they they really gave so much and some of them didn't make it home. Most of them did survive the war and were able to go home, but not all of them did. And one of the things we should also point out here, Jennifer, is not only did these women uh, swear the oath, uh, they wore a uniform. They were considered a, the rank, of, although they were just referred to as operators, they were considered the, an officer rank. But after the war, they didn't get treated that way, did they? Let's talk oh, a, no. a little bit about yeah, you're that right. problem. And this is this is just so heartbreaking. I when I learned about this, you know, I just felt so, you know, so devastated on their behalf. When they returned home, they you know and and started. Resuming their civilian lives. Some of them went back to their former jobs. Some of them got married and started families or moved on to other professions. And many of them, rightfully proud of their service, wanted to join local veterans group. They wanted to join the VFW. They wanted to have veterans benefits. They wanted to march in the veteran in in the memorial day parades and in the 4th of july parades in their uniforms along with other soldiers who had served and when they, throughout you know scattered around the country separately when they would apply to do to try to get these benefits and these special recognition they were told absolutely show us your discharge papers and then when they would write to the department of war um, and as for their discharge papers, they were told that they were mistaken. They had never actually been soldiers in the United States Army. They had been contracted civilian employees. And this was shocking 
and just devastating to the women because they, as you said, they had sworn military oaths. They had not been free to just quit their job as a civilian would, be, you know, if they didn't like the food or if it got too scary. You know, they were there for the duration and, you know, they they were they saluted. They were saluted themselves. So and, and the, even the officers they served with believed that they were actually in the army. So to hear that they had not been when they had never signed employment contracts was just absolutely yeah this you is, know, I, I, it's this just is just a, part of the part of the um, uh, societal discrimination that was occurring again this is 1919 right um, not only with women but it, w- with minorities and really is de- devastating uh, uh, to those women at the time I'm sure um, and it t- <laughs> this takes this country a long time to fix its problems but tell yeah. us about how this problem got fixed a little bit. Well, in there were uh, some of the um, some of the switchboard soldiers just said, "Okay, well, it's time to get ready for another battle." And you know, with the support of many of the male officers who had supervised them or had worked alongside them, they began another fight to get the recognition from the United States government that they deserved and that they had earned through their courageous service. So they, you know, the they and some of the men that they had served with lobbied politicians in Congress. They wrote letters and they really tried to mobilize support. But it finally, in 1977, more than 60 years after the end of the war, President Jimmy Carter signed a bill awarding the women of the U.S. Army Signal Corps honorable discharges and World War I victory medals, which officially recognized them as military veterans. Unfortunately, I mean, 1977, by that time, only 50 of those switchboard soldiers remained alive to celebrate in that victory. And, and, and I'm, I'm, and, I'm sorry to say Grace Banker was not one of them. Right. She had passed on by that time. And even though uh, they're all gone at this point, um, the Congressional Gold Medal that that was uh, brought forward uh, that you mentioned and hasn't passed should still be an effort made by people to get that to pass, in my opinion. We've talked to a lot of groups who have received the Congressional Gold Medal, whether they be Japanese or Chinese, Mm -hmm. uh, folks who fought and didn't get really get recognized. And, and it always comes back to this. That Congressional Gold Medal is valuable to the community. Yes. It'll be valuable to the community of descendants and women and telephone operators to get recognition finally. And that's really what yes. the Congressional Gold Medal would do here. Um, right. It seems to me, uh, Jennifer Chavarini, who wrote, who's the author here of Switchboard Soldiers, who we're talking to, that unless people like you write these stories that people read and the history gets relived, it's so easy to forget about it, isn't it? Well, it is, but you know there are so many stories of people who did who made wonderful contributions, whether it was in a military capacity or in science or, you know, and in the arts or just in serving in government and so many other aspects that are unsung, whose stories aren't told. And that's really what my passion for historical fiction is, to try to bring to light the the stories of people who maybe made it into the footnotes, if they made it into the narrative at all, but whose contributions were so very important that they deserve to be remembered. And I think especially in the case of the switchboard soldiers, they deserve to be honored, as you said, for their own family members, but also for all of us so that we can look back and be proud of what you know, our fellow Americans did and, you know, what's what immigrants did, because a lot of the, the women who went over were very recent immigrants. And, that, you know, that's why they had, were so fluent in French, because it was their their native language or that of their parents who immigrated. So I think it, it's important for us to recognize, you know, groups who maybe weren't always allowed to participate fully in society. And yet they valued this country so much 
and they value democracy so much that despite the discrimination, despite the setbacks that they faced, they wanted to contribute. And when they were given an opportunity to contribute, they absolutely went after it. You know, almost 8,000 women tried to get in and they knew that this was not going to be easy. All of the advertisements warned them that this was going to be hard, dangerous, difficult work. And yet they wanted to go. They wanted to do their part because they were proud to proud Americans and they wanted to show they they had these unique skills and they wanted to make sure that if this is what their country needs and they have those unique skills, well, it's absolutely their duty and their privilege to to serve if they are if they are permitted if they are selected. Well, and I think that's where Switchfold Soldiers gives us some lessons because you have this group that gets discriminated against, but they are still they overcome every challenge that's put in front of them, every adversity. The you know, and and it rings true today when we think about. Oh, that's the Spanish flu of 1918, 1919. Oh, we're in our own flu, COVID flu yes. problem today. Uh, yes. but, but their patriotism uh, continues to push them forward, even as they're trying to find cloth to make masks to wear uh, uh, to, for some limited uh, protection from from the Spanish flu. So there's a you know there's a lot of parallels to today's world, aren't there? There are. And if you think about you know the, the pandemic that they faced and the one that we face today, you know, one of our disadvantages is that our travel is so much swifter and so much easier. So things spread much more rapidly. On the other hand, we have better tools to diagnose and treat. But, you know, you can imagine being on one of these ships and you know, tr- crossing the Atlantic, and you're you're afraid of a German U-boat. You know that they might be lurking about. At the same time, there's this other deadly killer in the very air around you, and uh, you know, and you you hope that you survive that as well. So yes, it it was it was harrowing, and yet knowing what they were up again against, they more women wanted to become switchboard soldiers. Sometimes you hear them referred to as hello girls, um, the slang of the time. There were some uh, songs about it, uh, it, but it's a it's a really rich, interesting story about what was going on that we didn't know before we read the book. Uh, Jennifer, thanks for spending some time with Veterans Radio today. That was my pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me on. And I want to thank everybody for listening to Veterans Radio today. I am Jim Fawson. It's been a pleasure to be your host. I'm a veterans disability lawyer at Legal Help for Veterans, and you can reach us at 800-693-4800 or legalhelpforveterans.com on the web. You can follow Veterans Radio on Facebook and listen to its podcasts and Internet radio shows by going to veteransradio.net. And until next time, you are dismissed. If you have a VA claim denied by the Board of Veterans Appeals, contact Legal Help for Veterans at 1-800-693-4800. They're experts in handling cases before the U.S. Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims. Their number again, 1-800-693-4800. We again want to thank our national sponsors, the National Veterans Business Development Council, nvbdc.org, VA Ann Arbor Health Care System, the Vietnam Veterans of America, Charles S. Kettles Chapter, Ann Arbor, Michigan. VFW Graf O'Hara Post 423 in Ann Arbor. And the American Legion Press Corn Post 46, also in Ann Arbor. And the Veterans Lending Council, which advises lenders, realtors, buyers about VA Home Loan Program, and you can find them on Facebook. We appreciate all your support. You can go to veteransradio.net, click on the sponsor level, and continue to support keeping Veterans Radio on the air. And until next time, you are dismissed. 
Hey guys, it is Ryan. I'm not sure if you know this about me, but I'm a bit of a fun fanatic when I can. I like to work, but I like fun too. It's a thing. And now the truth is out there. I can tell you about my favorite place to have fun. Chumba Casino. They have hundreds of social casino style games to choose from with new games released each week. You can play for free anytime, anywhere And each day brings a new chance to collect daily bonuses. So join me in the fun. Sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. VTW group. Void prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18 plus.